and this again has changed over the years what I have done for Constitution. But um, this year, <laughs> for some reason, I don't know, I feel like just doing things the hard way this year. I don't, I'm not using a book, even though there are some great books out there. I'm just going to create my own program to teach my kids Constitution. My hey guys. I have six kids and I have been homeschooling for eight or maybe nine years. I've lost track, but it, in the whole time that I've been homeschooling, some of the structure that I've found that I, I do all the time has really provided a lot of comfort to me that I feel like, look, no matter what else I mess up, I'm going to do this. And I found a quote once from the founding fathers that said, in your elementary instruction, you need to really be good on four subjects. And then once you get beyond that, you're going to kind of decide what you're really interested in and pursue that. So the four subjects that he said you should really really focus on are understanding the Constitution, understanding your own religion, um, history, and cultural literacy. And so I try really hard to hit all four of those. So for cultural literacy, that's why I read, I do family reads. That's, I love it. I love doing family reads, but that's how I, I mark that off and say, yes, we are doing cultural literacy. We are definitely reading the books that uh, not only define our culture, but enable us to sort of talk with other people that everybody's heard of these books. And even if they haven't read them, they have an idea of what's in them. So that's what I do for cultural lit. Um, U.S. history, it changes every year what I do for U.S. history, but I do try to always cover some history so that we, we can just remember where we're coming from and where we're trying to go. That's a really important part of education in general. Um, your own religion. This is something that we work on. You know, we do scriptures as a family. We have goals that are oriented toward our religion and trying to live our religion, uh, go to church on Sunday, all of those things. We, we try to make, make sure that our kids understand our own religion. And the last one is constitution. And this again has changed over the years, what I have done for constitution. But, um, this year <laughs> for some reason, I don't know. I feel like just doing things the hard way this year. I don't, I'm not using a book, even though there are some great books out there. I'm just going to create my own program to teach my kids constitution. My kids are eight years old and the up through about 13 is the age range that I'm really teaching this particular subject to. I do have some older kids, but they're just off doing their own stuff um, because they're older. And so since I'm going to do this, I'm just going to drop a video once a month and let you know what resources and what we're going to be covering to teach constitution because a lot of you have asked, how do you teach constitution? I feel bad because I know that a lot of you are saying I have younger kids. How do I teach it to the younger kids? And the answer is, I don't know. I really just started teaching constitution as the kids got older. Um, to begin with, the constitution is just based on um, rules of treating other people well. So if your kids are learning how to share and how to um, understand that their role is to be the learner and your role is to be the teacher, that's the kind of stuff that's going to lead them to really understand the constitution as they get older. Now I'm, my kids are old enough that I can teach the constitution in uh, ways that they're just capable of understanding more stuff at this age. And so it's really time to be teaching them. But if you want to teach the constitution, this is how I'm going to do it. You can do it this with me, or, or maybe this just gives you ideas and you can kind of spring off and do your own thing from this. So here's what I'm doing. Um, again, I'm using the well-educated heart um, outline for the year. And how she has done it is she's just broken down the entire American history into month segments so that you get to cover all the different um, parts of the American history. Well, if I'm looking at the Constitution through the eyes of the explorers, they, there's no Constitution. It doesn't exist yet. But the seeds exist there. And so you're able to, I, I love this, that for the month of September, we're going to be doing a lot of looking at the different um, countries and the different governments that were in place that really fed into um, America and created a place where we, we saw what worked, we saw what didn't work, and we were able to create things that were really, really useful. Okay, so here's what we're doing. That is September. That's what we're going to be doing here. It's the exploration month. We're going to be focusing on the people who came before and what they did to to really inspire and give us information to see how to create a great constitution. Um, I'm going to be looking in the book 5,000 Year Leap by Cleon Skousen. And in that book, he talks about how the Anglo-Saxons and the Roman Empire both had different parts of their government that were super important, that were leading up to and informing what kind of a government that we had. So one of the things that the Anglo-Saxons did really, really well, and I think he says the children of Israel as well, um, that they had representation. So in the Bible, you see Moses breaking people um, down into groups and saying, I 
to begin with, it was just, I'm just going to see everybody who has a problem with their chicken or cow come to me and I'm going to solve that all the way up through, you know, somebody killed somebody. Like he had to deal with all of them on his own. And um, his father-in-law Jethro said, you, you dumb, stop that. You need to break it up into little pieces so that they can, everybody can govern themselves. And so this idea of having um, smaller units, it's called federalism. It's, and we see it as local government, um, state government or county government, state government, federal government. It's this idea that you're going to have a small group, like somebody who's over 10 people, and then you're going to have somebody who's over 50 people and somebody who's over 100 people. And you deal with whatever problems that you have at that lowest level. That if you're having some sort of problem with between neighbors, you really don't need to go talk to Moses. You know, you're able to work that out with your head of 10 people, or maybe if it's between you and somebody in another group, then you'll have to go to the head of 50. But it set up that idea of how to break down a society into smaller groups so that they can govern themselves and sort of move up as they need to interact with each other in these other groups without being a completely different nation, which we've understood how to break nations down into different, different countries all over the place. We can do that, no problem. But then they have wars with each other and that is a problem. And so this allows people to be broken up in their own units and solve their own problems without being separated from each other by some sort of national boundary. We are still connected. We're just able to solve problems on a smaller level. And so that's something that the Anglo-Saxons and the Israelites really um, did that informed our constitution. And then the Romans did a really great thing that the Romans separated. I feel like I'm talking fast the Romans separated their government into different areas. They had the Senate and they had the, I want to say triumvirate. I should have done more studying. I'll have to do a little more studying before um, I'm ready to teach that. But basically the Romans said the government should be broken up into, it shouldn't just be the king who says, I make the laws and then I execute the laws. And then I also um, judge everybody on the laws. I'm, I'm all of it. I am the person. And it's not just like, that's not normal for one king to try to do it all, but it is normal for the king to try to hold all of that power and say, well, I will delegate that power out to other people, but they're still gonna do what I tell them to do. You may be a judge, but you're just saying what I would say if I was there because I can't do, I don't have time in my day to do it all, but it's still essentially just me making all of these decisions. That has happened a lot through time. But this is different. In Rome, they said, we're going to separate this. We're going to have um, judges over here that are different and from the people who make the laws and they're over here. And it uh, was really fascinating. I found this out when I was teaching church, actually, that they... The publicans, which were the tax collectors, were actually an important force in the government that they got to have a lot of influence on the things that could happen in the government. And if you were a senator, you could not be a publican. And if you were a publican, you couldn't be a senator, right? Those two things were separated so that the senators, or sorry, the senators over here had the power to make the laws, but the... Um, the publicans were the ones who were really influential in saying, well, these are the people who get the contracts and these are the people that um, get to determine how we're going to use those laws. <laughs> they were kind of the executors of the law. And a lot of the senators didn't like that, that they wanted all of the power for themselves. And that did actually happen in Rome that they the power sucked to them. And then that mm, then they collapsed that you don't want the power to all be in one branch. But the point is that Rome was one of these great influencing factors that they showed us how to divide into different segments. So that's one of the things that we're going to cover. In addition, we're going to talk about the different areas of the world that experienced a lot of freedom themselves long, long before America became a country. Holland was very free and they were fighting for their freedom against oppressive nations. We will be reading about that. This is a Library of Hope book. It, it, and I'll put the link down below. Oh, that's gonna be a lot of work. I will do it for you. Um, the World Story, Volume 2, U.S. Colonies in the Netherlands from page 275 to 320. That's a big read. So actually, I think what I'm planning on doing there is breaking that up into the, the four different weeks that fall in September. So this is the whole month of September. And I didn't really divide this one out the way that I did with science. I just kind of said, we're, gonna, we're just going to go and do stuff. So if I really feel like let's just work on Holland Freedom today, and, and that's all we do for that day. And then another day, we'll talk about Rome. 
and then we can do it that way. So I'm kind of saying, this is what we're doing in the month. You can divide it however you want, but probably I'm going to divide that one into four different reads because that's a lot of reading. Um, and then also we're going to be getting into the Renaissance because the Renaissance was not just an artistic Renaissance where they started saying, hey, this is a great idea and we can we can create depth in our, in our paintings and everything. It was an, a Renaissance in all the different areas. There was such a Renaissance of ideas and freedom. Um, so we're going to be reading The World Story, which again, this is a Libraries of Hope book. Um, um, volume 16 of Roman Italy, pages 51 through 76. And that's going to give us kind of an insight into the freedoms and the idea of freedom that are really coming from this place of, um, I mean, there's so much freedom that's happening then. The freedom that used to, with all the different artists, they used to have their guilds and they said, don't, we don't share our information with any other guild. We're very locked down. This is very much just us and just everything that we're going to do um and the, and during the renaissance they broke that open they said we're not going to have guilds anymore we're just going to share this information and it was eye-opening and mind-blowing for so many people that it was you are using paint in that way i never even knew that you could use paint in that way and so everybody you know all the boats went up with the tide and it just became so much better everybody improved and not just in art in all sorts of areas of the um learning and uh, freedom and everything and so we're going to be uh, learning about that I don't know if you can tell, but this is one of my loves. It's one of my passions. I love freedom. I love the ability that we have been given to be free and the importance that it that we have to be able to maintain that freedom through being aware of what it is, where it came from, and how we need to live to uh, continue keeping it. So that September, I will catch you guys in one month and I will let you know what we're going to be doing for October to study the Constitution. You are doing really, really important things as a mom, as a dad. I mean, specifically about teaching the Constitution, where else is this going to happen? Who is teaching the Constitution anymore? This is kind of unique. So if you're doing this, this really, really matters. This is powerful stuff and you're doing a much better job than you think you are. And if you have any other ideas about how you wanna do this, we put it in the comments because I'm always open to ideas and incorporating new things. Uh, thanks so much and I'll see you on the next one.